What's up, everybody? Welcome to the infirmary. That is my channel and my home. I'm sure you can tell, but I have been sick for about two weeks now. Um, last week, I had no voice. Like, probably the first time in my life that I genuinely lost my voice, and it was for four days straight. Sorry if I'm, like, gasping for breath. Um, it's now week two, and me and my two-year-old son are both very sick. For some reason, my husband is just getting by unscathed. <sighs> the books never sleep. The reading must continue. Um, January. January tried her hardest to put me in a reading slump. She was relentless. She was mean. She was rude. And she almost succeeded. Honestly, the jury is still out if I'm in a reading slump or not. I don't know. First, let me just say, I was so excited to start a new year of reading. I have a killer TBR, honestly. Let me know if any of you want to see a TBR video. I decided to do a challenge and I'm actually filming this. It should be out hopefully in like a month. It's taking a while, but basically I am reading all of the books that won the Goodreads Awards. So if you don't know, at the end of the year, Goodreads picks like best fantasy, best romance, best historical fiction, best thriller, and I am reading all of them every genre. So that is taking a long time. But to sum it up, it's going really, really, really badly. And a lot of those books were in January. This just was a bad month. I read seven books. Okay, the last one I technically finished at like 9am on February 1st, but I'm counting it as January because I am not bringing that bad vibe into February. February is going to be a, a month of like, cute romances and amazing books from other genres that I've never heard of before. I am determined. I'm manifesting it. February is going to be better. That being said, let's go over what I read in January. First up, Tell Me Lies by Corolla Lovering, something like that. I cannot believe that this was this month. Basically, Tell Me Lies is the most messed up romance I've ever read it was so incredibly frustrating and the whole time I was reading it I was just like oh my god these are like the most unlikable characters I think I will ever 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 be forced to read about I ended up giving it three stars so basically tell me lies is about a college student named Lucy she goes to school she has like this really nasty relationship with her mom because of something that happened and you don't find it out for like a million pages but she constantly is referencing it and being super mean to her mom she ends up meeting this guy steven and he's like two years older than her and he is just such a f boy <laughs> and she falls for him so hard and it's just this the whole book is just manipulation like that is the entire book but the problem is that lucy herself is so incredibly unlikable that it's not even like come on lucy get rid of him he's a bad guy like she is also a bad person i don't know if that's an unpopular opinion but it's just so incredibly toxic i felt so angry the whole time like at both her and steven and honestly like a lot of characters in the book but mostly those two it's like they are perfect for each other because I don't want anyone else in the world to be tainted by these two and their horrific manipulative ways there's so much cheating there's so much emotional abuse so much gaslighting it's just really sick however let me talk to you from my review I said I flipped back and forth between two and three stars several times before landing on three this book was toxic above anything else the main character was frustrating. I found my eye, I found myself rolling my eyes in every single chapter. No one can dispute how unlikable Steven is. Oh, I guess like what I wanted to say is that they both seem like sociopaths. Like, I feel like that's what the book is alluding to, but I'm not like a psychology major. I'm not trying to like tell you what a sociopath is, but they both, Steven and Lucy both harp on the fact that like they are so unemotional and the things that typically bother other people don't bother them. And the only thing that does get to them is like feeling slighted by other people. As painful as it is to read about Lucy starving herself, talking about her friends from a placement of judgment or jealousy every single time, I moved up to three stars because Lucy's character is real. 
it's really hard to put myself back into the mindset of being a girl in college, but I also had a relationship where I was strung along and manipulated for years. It's so easy from the outside to think this girl's stupid, but I think Lucy's story is actually far more common than we know. Stephen's character felt like a caricature at times. I know someone very similar to this, and for that reason, I moved it up to a three. Um, I totally forgot about the eating disorder thing. Yeah, that's huge. Like, if you struggle with restrictive um, eating in any way, it could possibly be triggering. I will say that they made a Hulu show. I think it's Hulu. And I watched it right after this. And the show is a lot different than the book. And I would say the show is kind of like along the same storyline. I mean, Lucy and Steven are still unlikable, but it's like slightly less toxic and they completely remove the eating disorder part of it from the show, which makes it, I think, a little bit more palatable. So three stars. Then I thought briefly that things might look up because I read The Idea of You by Robin Lee. And Ali Scott had recommended this and she like said it was one of her favorite books of all time. I really liked it. I gave it four stars. It's about, I don't know how to say her name, Solen. Maybe she's like this very sophisticated French American woman who works at an art gallery and she has a 12 year old daughter and she brings her daughter to like a boy band concert. And she ends up like getting hit on by one of the boy band members who's like 20 and they start a relationship and they're like jet setting all over the world. And she is like this older mom dating this 20 year old boy band member and they don't ever say it, but like he's British. He is tall with like dark curly hair. Like he's supposed to be Harry Styles, I believe. And that's what I was picturing the whole time I was reading it. And it's just pretty good. Like the fact that he's in a boy band and it's like this age gap, I feel like it really could have been so like cheap and corny, but it's actually like a pretty heavy book. The ending, I really respect. And it was, it was good and it was steamy. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I listened to The Hotel Nantucket and this was my first Elin Hildebrand book. And I've heard that she's just like the beach read woman. And I really enjoyed this one in the depths of winter as an audiobook. So the main character is Elizabeth and she is like in the hotel industry and she like runs this business with her boyfriend and then he cheats on her. So she ends up like leaving their business they have together and she becomes the general manager of this really historical hotel that this random billionaire bought and like wants to make into the next hip place in Nantucket. You're getting Lisbeth's point of view, you know, recovering from her relationship, wanting to be a successful like businesswoman. You're getting the point of view of the hotel ghost, which sounds corny, but actually was like a good twist. You're getting the point of view of one of the girls at the front desk. There might be more. I'm not sure, but there's just like so many characters and you really get to hear like the process of hiring all these people for the hotel and how they all work together. And it's really good. Like the more I think about it, I'm like, wow, that book was really enjoyable. I was really invested in like almost every character storyline and there was quite a few twists and resolutions that I really enjoyed. And there's like this thing running through the whole book where there's like this mysterious Instagram account that rates hotels and she has never, ever, ever given a five star rating to any hotel. And so they are determined to get that five star rating. And so it's like the whole book is building up to them getting a visit from this person, but they will never know when she's coming to visit because she, no one knows who she is. I really enjoyed it. Like I'm, I have another Elin Hildebrand book um, queued up in an audiobook, and I'm saving that for when I need like some sunshine when things are getting too depressing. And I like apologize for this lighting. The sun is going down. Then, 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 then this happened. House of Guy and Breck one best fantasy. So that's on the Goodreads list. But it, that is the second book in the Crescent City series. So I had to read this one first. This book is 800 pages. I loved Akatar. This is the same author, Sarah J. Mass. So I was prepared. Okay. Fantasy, lots of world building. It's going to be a love story. Like I was ready for all that. I felt genuinely like I was reading another language when I was reading this book. The world building in the first third of the book was so intense that I felt like I had to read it like this, like out loud. 
The Asteri had created the angels to be their perfect soldiers and loyal servants. The angels, gifted with such power, had relished their role in the world until Shahar, the archangel they'd once called the Daystar, until Hunt and the others who'd flown in Shahar's elite 18th Legion. Like, I had to read it so slow out loud to comprehend what I was reading because there were so many names, so many legions and different types of angels and houses and courts, and I was like, I can't focus. And the book only started getting good when, like, I could basically ignore all of that and just get, like, the outline of what was going on and, like, the relationships and the love story. I ended up giving it three stars. I was, I mean, it got really good at the end. Like, I really enjoyed the end. I ended up switching to audiobook at about 20% because I was struggling so hard to, like, read it and comprehend it. I thought I could listen to it. And I... I feel like that saved it. Like, I don't know if I would have finished it if I tried to read it. Hi, guys. <laughs> Editing me. Popping on here. Excuse my appearance. As you saw earlier in the video, I do have COVID. And things are just getting worse. But I realized that I didn't even say what Christmas City series is about. So, just really quickly. The main character's name is Bryce Quinlan. She's half fey, half human. And in the beginning of the book, something incredibly tragic happens to someone in her life. And she is just devastated by that. So the rest of the book is like her teaming up with this guy, Hunt. He's an angel. And they're like trying to figure out, they have different motives. Like she's trying to figure out what happened to that person. And then he is also, he has orders from his boss to find this magical horn. And... Um, other people in the city are looking for it too. So there's like two different motives, but they are working together. And then that ends up becoming the love story, her and Hunt. There's just like a huge amount of characters in this book. The main difference between, to me, the main difference between Crescent City and Akatar. In Akatar, it's very much like the humans are divided from the fae by like a wall and this one is very much like the humans are the scum of the world and all these magical mythical people are higher up and they live in a city and there are some humans that like live in the city with them but a lot of them are slaves there's all these different houses wolves are in one house angels are in another house like necromancers whatever the heck that is I don't want to try and explain all that because I honestly don't get it and to me I had to ignore it to understand the book but the biggest difference is like this world that they're living in is pretty much the same as our world now, except there are like wolves and fairies and angels. Like they have social media. They talk about reality TV. They talk about like getting drunk and doing drugs and like texting on their phone. Like it's very much like this world, but they have like pointy ears and wings. So that was a lot different than Akatar. And it really kind of jarred me for a second when they're talking about like trashy reality TV. Yeah, I can't believe I'm filming this looking this way, but the face of COVID. So three stars. Then we did All Good People Here by Ashley Flowers. And I was so excited because I love Crime Junkie. If you listen to True Crime Podcasts, of course you know Crime Junkie. Ashley Flowers is the host. I totally forgot she wrote a book. And so I was excited to listen to it. I chose audiobook because I thought she would read it. But she only does the epilogue. It was pretty disappointing. I'm sad to say that. But it was. It's about a reporter who goes back to her hometown to take care of her uncle who has Alzheimer's, I believe. And she is covering the case of like a missing girl. And it's it's reminding her a lot of when her friend went missing when they were children. And she's trying to draw a connection between the two cases. And so you're getting like what's happening in present day. And then you're also getting what happened back when they were kids. And you're getting her point of view. And you're also getting the point of view of the mother, I believe, of the her friend that died. 
I will say it was pretty twisty turny. The thing about it that was weird is that it is John Benet Ramsey. She wrote this story as like a parody of John Benet Ramsey saying like what she thinks happened to John Benet, and that's like what happened to the girl in this story. Um, I don't know that for sure, but that's what it felt like to me because it was so close to John Benet Ramsey. There's no way that we're not supposed to make that connection because it was so obvious. Then, then, then we did TJR, Carrie Soto is back. This one, best historical fiction, which, okay, I know historical means anything in the past, right? But when I think historical fiction, I think the 1700s, the 1800s. This takes place in 1995. I was born in 1991. So the fact that this is being considered historical fiction, I find like offensive. Anyway, it's about Carrie Soto. She's a famous tennis player. She comes out of retirement because she wants to beat um, the girl who's about to take her record of like most championship wins or something like that. So it's about her career as a tennis player and like she's she's super competitive. She they call her, I think they call her the bitch. Like that's her her like sports name. She's not friendly with fans or with teammates. Like she's just known as a like an ice queen basically in the tennis world. She's just so unlikable and I know that's the point that she's supposed to be unlikable, but I also feel like you're supposed to root for her and I like, was not. I think it's also the fact that I just, just, just watched King Richard, which is the true story of the father of Serena and Venus Williams. So it's like, this was so similar to that I felt and I was like, why am I reading so many tennis books? Um, I think I gave it four stars, but it was just okay. Like I, I mean, it's a story. The fact that it's historical fiction, I, I don't know what else was happening in that category last year. Now that I know the 90s are considered historical fiction, um, I assume a lot was happening in that category. Oh my god, my camera's about to die. I have one more book. Apologize for the horrible lighting. We're basically filming in the dark right now. One more book. So after Carrie Soto is back, I read the sequel to this gargantuan book, which was House of, I have to look it up because I can never remember the name. House of Sky and Breath. Sequel. We got Bryce and Hunt back together again. Romance. Tons of steam. I, <laughs> you'll see it when you come back for the Goodreads video, but like, okay, so I started it on my Kindle and the problem was that every night I was laying down to read, excited to read, I would make it like five minutes and then I would be like, no, I don't want to read this anymore. I'm falling asleep. I'm bored. I'm bored. I'm bored. And so I was like, the only way I'm ever going to get through this book and through this challenge is to listen to an audiobook. So I have this video where I'm like grocery shopping and it was like a super steamy sex scene. And I was like, this is so awkward. Like imagine if my headphone died at that exact moment, because when my headphones die, it automatically starts playing out of my phone. I just, the horror. Yeah, that one was tough. I really struggled to get through it. Like I constantly was zoning out. It was just like all over the place. I had no idea what was going on at any point. I was so overwhelmed by the cast of characters. The ending was like, shocking though the same as this one like the ending i sways me where i'm like oh my god no it's five stars but no it's not because i hated it until the ending i gave it three stars like after going through some goodreads reviews i'm like um mm, yeah like i agree with that i don't agree with that and i went down to three that ending was like i mean if you know you know the rest of it i just did not enjoy it to me it's just like avatar is so much better so much more enjoyable to read I don't know, like, am I not into fantasy? Because this one, was, this series is so intense with the world building. So much more than Akatar, I think. And it just really, I can't, I just can't. I don't know if it's just because I'm like a distracted person. It's really not for me. So these two books, House of Earth and Blood, House of Sky and Breath, damn near put me in a reading slump. Like, they are so long and print and audiobook I just hated it I hated it and I felt so like discouraged and especially because this is like this series won best fantasy like I'm pretty sure this one this book won best fantasy on Goodreads whatever year it came out and then the sequel won it in 2022 and so it's just like this is the best fantasy and I don't like it 
And so it really was discouraging. And then you'll see it in my February video, but I just finished my first book of February and it also was a doozy. So I'm just feeling kind of crappy right now. Like I just want February to be, I mean, I, I have to do this Goodreads challenge and I'm excited, but also I want to read like some romances. Like, so if you know of any like cheesy, happy, feel good romances, let's try and do Valentine's romances this month. I want to get a few. I'm going to go on the library website tonight and see what's available. I just, I need something to make me not hate reading right now. I don't hate reading. I just, I'm so bummed out by all these books. Like, but let me know if you have any other book video requests that you want to see, because I have some lined up, but obviously some of you are here for the book videos. And so if you want to see anything specific, let me know. I'll see you next time. Bye.